Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to Marker Devices uh, uh, webinar. Uh, today, we're going to uh, learn about uh, live cell imaging to investigate the regulation of cell uh, division timing. Uh, the the main um, uh, presenter will be Rudy Jagor from uh, the Curie Institute. Um, again, thank you, everybody, for joining this uh, this webinar. Uh, before we hand it over to Rudy, we'll um, uh, I'll give a short introduction into um, uh, high content screening, uh, high throughput imaging, and the, the products that are available for medical devices. Uh, actually, before that, uh, if, if for, this is for those who can't hear, uh, or if there's some issue in the middle of the webinar, uh, there's a technical support line uh, up. Um, and also, you can send your uh, questions by Q and A. We'll take questions anytime, whether they're technical or about the the content. Um, uh, I'll just leave this up for a minute, so you can write this phone number down if there's a, a problem during the webinar. Webinar. Um, and uh, as just to introduce myself, I'm uh, Vishal Chandy. I'm the product manager of cellular imaging at Molecular Devices. Um, and I'll be doing that short introduction. Uh, Rudy is, is joining us from the Institute Curie. Uh, she just recently finished her PhD there in an inter in, interdisciplinary lab. Uh, and she's both been working on cell division and its regulation, and in particular me mechanical clues um, uh, that, that me the mechanical clues that help with uh, understanding when, this, when cell division will happen. Um, and she will be moving on to her postdoc um, at the Ecole Polytechnique, working with Abdul Barakat um, on um, uh, uh, the Achilles Stein on San Cardiovascular Disease. Okay, and at the very end, we'll take uh, uh, questions, and we have a moderator online uh, from Jane Hefty will uh, be compiling the questions that you submit, and we'll ask them verbally to, to the panelists. So how do you submit a Q and A? Um, press on the Q and A button. At, it's actually at the top. Um, uh, select Q and A. Uh, type in your, your question in here, where it says type your question here. Uh, type the question. Hit the send button uh, and choose all panelists so we all see that question. Okay. And then uh, Jane Hesley will compile those questions. Um, and um, ask them. If it's a technical question, we have uh, somebody from WebEx on, online, uh, Jennifer, who can, will be able to troubleshoot uh, your technical problem. Okay, so um, a little bit about um, high content screening. It, it's, a, it's essentially a way to collect uh, image, many, many images, but uh, it enables hundreds of applications. And we like to say it enables applications from apoptosis to zebrafish, from A to Z. And on the screen, you're seeing a list of uh, a variety of applications that people are using with um, with, in, with high content screening: angiogenesis, RFNG, cell proliferation, micronuclei counting, uh, mitochondrial localization, uh, kinase activation, and all the way up to whole animal to use fish assay. Okay. So if these type of assays, if they were you're trying to do it with a microscope, you would have your sample in a slide, possibly, or, or, or maybe a little dish. You take a picture on a, on a, a microscope, uh, and, then, and then what you do with it, and how do you collect many, many images. And I think Julie Stockwell is a nice example of, of, uh, of using a system to collect many, many, many images and reducing the time that would typically take hours to minutes for the same area. And really is not really using it in typical high quality screening fashion to uh, do screening for drugs or RNAi, but she's using it as a, a, a reliable, sophisticated video microscopy, uh, video microscopy tool. But the typical ACS workflow uh, is, is not video microscopy. It's to acquire those images, uh, identify uh, objects uh, within those images, uh, make some type of multi-parametric data and output, and, um, and then have a way to make sense of those large number of numbers that are coming off, off the system and to pick 
find our data mine your data. And with Method Devices, we have a, a, a complete solution. On the top left is the Image Access Micro, which is our wide field system, and that's what Julie has been using and we'll be talking about how she uses that. We additionally have the Image Express Ultra, which is a uh, uh, focal uh, screening device. Um, we have ways of importing third-party uh, images into our, uh, into our solution. It's all tied together with MDC Store, which is a data management solution to manage those images that are coming into the database. Um, we have MetaExpress and MetaExpress PowerCore, which is an option on MetaExpress for the image analysis. That's the step to convert those images into numbers. And lastly, we have a 3D Express to help with that hit selection. So that's just the overview of HCS and molecular devices products. But uh, now I'd like to turn it over to Julie uh, to discuss her, her, um, her application. Hi. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Grisha, for this uh, nice introduction and uh, also for uh, the invitation to give this uh, webinar today. I am really pleased to uh, talk about uh, the work I've been doing during my PhD uh, with Mathieu Pell at the Institut Curie in Paris. I've worked on uh, the regulation of the uh, cell division uh, timing. And so this, uh, to, to do so, I, I had to set up a very strong protocol and robust uh, protocol uh, of live cell imaging system. And today I will talk about this, uh, this uh, live cell imaging system and also uh, talk about the, my, the results I, I got during this study. Um, to start, I would like to highlight that uh, cancer is a disease related to cell division. As you can see here, a uh, tumor is uh, developing because of an excess of proliferation, uh, which is, in fact, a misregulation of cell division in a tissue. So it is quite obvious that understanding better how cell division is regulated and controlled, even using model system or in vitro uh, cell culture, culture cells, can uh, be very helpful to understand how a tumor develops and thus uh, to, to design a new, uh, new treatment to treat cancer. So here is the scheme of representative cell division. So it's a, it's a very complex uh, process with different steps. It starts with a, with a very well-known mitosis. Uh, mitosis uh, gives rise right to two daughter, daughter cells that are identical to the mother cell, and this is the motor for cell proliferation. So at the end of the mitosis, um, the, the cytoplasm of the daughter cell has to be separated into two daughter cells during the last step of cell division, which is called cytokinesis. And my work has been focused on this uh, very last step, cytokinesis. Uh, here is the more detailed scheme of the different steps of cytokinesis. It starts at the end of the mitosis by the positioning in a equatorial manner of a contractile ring, which is made of actin and myosin, and this ring will uh, contract and squeeze, and squeeze the material between the, between the ring, and this will lead to the formation of a, a really tiny grid, which is connecting the two daughter cells. And uh, when the cells will be spreading on the substrate, this grid at some point will be cut and several during a step called abscission. And actually my work has been uh, even more focused on this uh, very last step uh, of cytokinesis, which is called abscission. Actually the existence of this tiny bridge connecting the two daughter cells uh, has been described a very long time ago. Here you can see two pictures uh, from 1968 and 1977, where I show here on the top uh, in cell control imaging, the two doctor cells connecting by this tiny bridge. They also, uh, it has been also described uh, electronic, uh, by, by electronic pictures. The infrastructure of the bridge, which is filled uh, by uh, micro tubules, actually, uh, but this uh, bridge uh, is, I mean, it, it has not been understood uh, very well how it, it is cut. 
uh, at this time, uh, results have shown that uh, the separation of the daughter cells uh, is achieved through movement of the cells that can break the bridge. But very recently, uh, so last year actually, a new model uh, based on the molecular analysis has been proposed um, for the serving of the bridge. And this model allows both a serving of the plasma membrane by the FCO3 component and the serving of the microtubules inside the bridge by the FASCO. So at the end, it's a very complex molecular mechanism that actively, actively serves the bridge and it's not a, a bad breaking of the bridge. So for the moment, it's not very well known how everything is regulated in time, but still the molecular diary starts to be understood. If I come back to my, my previous uh, screen, something really important here is that all the different steps of cell division have to be very well coordinated, both in space and in time. And this is really important to allow that there is no error during division, because one error could be really dangerous for the cell and, and start also um, and to introduce really a strong error in the DNA segregation. So regarding the attrition, the, the step which I am, I am interested in, the regulation in space is quite well understood because it takes place on the side uh, of the grid, a region just next to the new body, which is the central region of the grid, for the microtubules of the Latin. And also very recently, uh, paper came out and they explained that we can even uh, predict uh, the site of the attrition by a biophysical model. On the contrary, the regulation in time is uh, much less clear. Uh, indeed, the first steps of cytokinesis are very fast and reproducible, always between 5 and 10 minutes, but the attrition test uh, the abscission set can be very slow, from one to five hours to cut this tiny bridge, and also very variable. So we still have a lot of questions to answer, like uh, what takes, why it takes uh, such a long time, why is it so variable, and also uh, is there a triggering signal? And actually, we have said quite a long time ago that in our hands, uh, the same cell line just by modifying uh, the way we culture them, so either on bare glass or on fabulating photographs, this was able already to change um, the abscission timing, meaning the, the time for the cells to cut the bridge. So we better started to be interested uh, in understand the parameters that could control the timing of abscission. And in particular, I was interested to, uh, to study the role of the cell environment on this regulation. And to perform the study, I needed need two things. First, a very good uh, video microscopy uh, system and also protocol. And I needed also to control the cell microenvironment and uh, did it uh, uh, by using microfabric system. And today I will talk a bit uh, about this, uh, this uh, two protocols that I set up. And also show you uh, the results uh, of the study. Uh, so first, the, the, the models we are using uh, are uh, in vitro cancer cells. These cells are Shina cells, Kyoto uh, cells, so it's a particular uh, cell line. Uh, it's steadily, uh, steadily expressing fluid contributors for DNA in red and microtubules in green. And so with this cell line, we can really easily follow the different steps of cell division uh, from the beginning, metastasis and metastasis, and also until the end. So you can see here that we can follow the formation of the bridge, the maturation, and so also the saving of the bridge here uh, on the very last image, which is abscission. And with this alarm, we can easily recall uh, the abscission time, meaning the delay between anastase and abscission. So the second part has been to set up a good protocol of lysinizing. Uh, Indeed, uh, recall movies of dividing cells is quite challenging because first, usually the objects we want to follow are really uh, small, and second, uh, the dividing cells are very sensitive to phototoxicity. And so uh, I had to set up uh, quite a lot of things, and I thought it would be nice to share with you today uh, that these different solutions are brought 
um, to the, um, the technical pro problem. So first, uh, the, the first concern is that the time cycle is very long, meaning one time is dividing more or less as the 20 or 45 hours. Uh, and the second point is that, uh, on top of that, is that synchronizing cells and to have them dividing uh, all at the same time is not really, uh, uh, it's quite difficult to handle because it uh, introduced defects, especially in cytokinesis. And as I am interested in studying the cytokinesis, I really don't want any defects during this defect. So what I did is just I performed very long term meetings, 24 to 30 hours long. And this, uh, to do so, I really needed a very stable system, uh, which, was, which was also adapted to cell survival. So with a temperature control, a CF control, or a use of CLD in the balance system. The second point was that uh, the grid, uh, which I am studying, is very thin. It's in mean one micron to two microns in diameter. So to really turn the object and to follow it in fluorescence, I really uh, needed a really high resolution imaging. And on top of that, I also needed a very robust photofocus. This was a very important point because as soon as the focus is a bit out, uh, even few microns, it's enough to, to just to lose the signal of the tiny bridge. The third the point was that, as everybody, I needed quite high statistics to perform that thing. And to, uh, to do so, I had to use a low magnification imaging, which allowed me to have large field of view and to increase the event of cell division in my field of view. And I coupled with that a multi positioning acquisition for using dry imaging objectives uh, to really allow uh, the maximum of position to have the, the maximum uh, the, of, um, of events. But here already something uh, for multi position is important. <laughs> So here, already, there are two phones that are quite difficult to gather, uh, very high resolution, and also a low magnification imaging. And so I, I, I solved this problem using uh, an objective which is 20x, so quite low magnification, but with a very high numerical aperture, 0 0.75, uh, which allowed um, to, to follow very well in fluorescence this really tiny bit. So combining a low magnification objective and high resolution objective was really essential for my students here. The third point, uh, the, the, the last point of uh, this part, was that uh, dividing cells are very sensitive to phototoxicity. And, and to overcome that, uh, it's really important to decrease the illumination of the temple. And this means to optimize the optical system, and this means also to achieve a better signal with a lower exposition time. So everything which allows you to decrease the exposition of the cells is uh, very good to keep your cells alive. And so I use um, different uh, tricks. First, I use glass bottom dishes or candles instead of uh, plastic dishes, uh, which decreases the autofluorescence of the plastic. I use also a medium without uh, final rain, uh, which is really important to decrease uh, the background, especially uh, when uh, using a low magnification objective. The next point was to, was to avoid a phase objective because the phase objectives are usually less bright, less bright sorry, because of the phase ring, and uh, this allowed me to, uh, to decrease the exposition of the cells and increase the, um, in, increase the fluorescence of the blood. Then uh, I think it's also good to decrease the power of the illumination using, for example, local density filter. Uh, this is important to decrease first the power of illumination before decreasing the exposure time. Finally, uh, it was important to avoid uh, to do these tasks, if possible, to again decrease the exposition of the cell. 
And uh, typically, using a low magnification uh, objective with a high depth of view allows us to, uh, uh, to not do this tax. And finally, I just would like to say that um, when, when the formal movie of dividing cells, it's, you don't really need crazy images, but what you need is just images on which you can quantify what you are looking at. And this is really important to keep that in mind, to so keep yourself alive, and, uh, and then still studying what you are, what you are looking at. So here is the example of uh, the type of movie that I'm recording, recording uh, on the image extract microsystem we have uh, using this uh, line that I presented uh, with uh, red uh, DNA and uh, green microtubule. has been performed with uh, an objective which is a 20x 0 0.75 uh, numerical aperture using a very robust laser-based autofocus, and this is a movie of 24 hours with 4 minutes time lapse. And you can see on this movie that you can really well follow uh, the cells, follow the details of microtubules, even sometimes single microtubules. You can follow also the cell division, for example, here. You can even see this grid between the dot of cells and the sizing of the bridge at, uh, during the set called abscission. So after that, the last, uh, the last part uh, was to, to, to use microfabricated substrates in order to control the cell uh, microenvironment. And first, I just used a coating of adhesive molecule to control the adhesion of the cell. For example, here, I used carbonic composite glass, and I compared the behavior of the cells uh, with cells taken on their glass. And after that, I use micropartum surfaces to control uh, specifically the spatial confinement of the cells. And here is a well-known technique, a uh, microfabrication technique, uh, where uh, we can control and design a uh, uh, motif uh, pattern of different size and also different shapes. Uh, these motifs are adhesive and uh, they are surrounded in gray by a non-adhesive uh, coating. So finally, uh, it's easy. So here is a montage of uh, many, uh, many fields of view and many cells. So you can easily control the space that the cells have by taking one mother cell uh, on, on, on one spot. And then uh, I was able to record a movie, a division movie, and then follow the two data cells after the division. So now if I come back to uh, the goal of my study, so uh, the, the main idea was to investigate the parameters that are controlling the timing of application. So this I use the live imaging uh, system of my division. And the second part was to, uh, to understand the realm of the cell environment and the regulation of the abscission timing. So first, uh, I, I, I showed that uh, cell density was an important parameter and was able to, uh, to regulate abscission time. Here, cells that are less and less dense uh, have uh, abscission which is longer. So decreasing the density increase the abscission time. But here, another parameter that could be important uh, is the cell cell contact number, because when you decrease the, the cell density, you also decrease the contact with the neighbor cells. So to, to get rid of this parameter, I use this time the microfabricated surface. So I use this of different sizing to control specifically the, the space that the dot of cells have and to avoid any other cell cell contacts with other neighboring cells. So here is a movie of how cells behave on this different disk. So first on the very small disk, so the mother cell is causing the whole disk, but then the dot of cells are very close from each other 
and they say we need some science in Sudan. Then on the Libyan disk, 50 micron in diameter, you can see that the battle cells have a bit more space, uh, but still they are confined on the disk. Again, bigger disk, you see that the mother cell has big trouble to cover the whole surface, but the battle cells, they can, they can move almost freely, but still they are confined on the disk. And on even bigger disk, uh, you can see that the battle cells are almost free to move, and they can go very far away. So using this uh, this uh, series of sticks, I I quantified the accretion time and I showed that uh, the um, a gradual increase in the accretion time with the increase of the diameter of the disk means the time that uh, the important parameter was the spatial confinement. When the cells are less confined, the accretion is made. Finally, I wanted to check that. Uh, addition was not an important parameter, but uh, separation was an important parameter. And to do so, I used a series, series of bars, so short bars, and then longer, longer, and even a uh, line. So this allowed, us, uh, allowed me to uh, impose a maximum separation between the daughter cells and have very few addition of the cells. And I saw again a very uh, uh, strong impact of this maximal separation. The cells that separate further have a delayed accretion time. And this parameter of separation was quite easy also to quantify uh, on cells that are free to move on the PD surface and not necessarily on micro pattern surface. So I came back to um, the 2D surface, and I just quantified the separation speed of the daughter cells right after the division. And I saw that uh, I have a strong correlation between the accretion time and the separation speed of the daughter cells, meaning that um, the, fastest, uh, cells, the faster cells separate after division, the longer accretion uh, is delayed. So this uh, leads to the conclusion that really the main parameter which is regulating the accretion time is the, the separation of the daughter cells. So here I would like to summary a bit uh, what, what I showed you uh, before. So uh, I showed that the time step of cell division, accretion, is regulated in time by the environment of the daughter cell because I show that uh, abscission is delayed when the spatial confinement of the data cell is low, when the maximum separation of the data cell is high, and also when the separation speed is high. But at some point, uh, we ask us uh, what could be the, the mechanism involved in this regulation. And so to finish the presentation, I would like to show you a bit the study uh, we have done uh, to investigate this mechanism, although it's not a very high throughput study, but more um, a high resolution and also biomechanical measurement uh, study. So the, the idea was that uh, I showed that the faster time separate, the longer abscission was made. And we thought that probably when the cell separates fast, they can maybe turn on the bridge which is connecting them, exactly on this, uh, as on this point. And so we, we saw that maybe the tension in, the, in this bridge, which is connecting the dust cells, uh, could be regulated to uh, the action. And in this case, it could be a bit counterintuitive, but the high tension, instead of helping the action, would more delay this event. And on the contrary, a low tension would allow a fast abscission. And uh, the extreme case would be that a release of tension could trigger maybe the abscission. So to test this uh, hypothesis, uh, we first did uh, measurements to uh, assess this uh, tension in the bridge, so to measure it. We did it using a laser aggression system. Here, on, you see on the left, the movie. So we basically we cut one side of the bridge and follow the reflection of the bridge exactly as if we would 
uh, cut an elastic and follow the retraction of the elastic. So you can see here on the chromograph that you have really fast movement of here we take the new body as a landmark. And by following um, a retraction curve, we can measure an, an initial speed of retraction, and this is, uh, this is correlated with the tension in the page. We use also um, another setting called torsion for cytoscopy, combined again with a good ablation. And finally, we got a value of cell cell forces, so the forces between the cells, which is around 1.5 nanometers. So it is very small to be able to detect it, but at the scale of the cell, it's a quite high tension. So the second part was uh, to correlate this tension with the behavior of the dust cell. So to do, to do so, we measure the tension in the bridge using this ablation system. And we saw a good correlation with the tension and the, the speed of separation of the daughter cells. Uh, and as I showed you before, we showed also that the speed of separation uh, was correlated with the accession time. So it's a bit of correlation with the correlation, but still we show that uh, the more tension we have in the bridge, the longer the accession is delayed. We also use the, uh, uh, we also investigate the cell contractility. We use a drug called Y57 to decrease the cell contractility. It's actually, actually a inhibitor of broken layers, which activates myosin 2. And so when we decrease the cell contractility, we drastically decrease or almost decrease the, the tension in the bridge. And we also drastically decrease the accession time, meaning that when the cells are not contracting anymore, they cannot pull on the bridge, there is no tension, and accession is very fast. And finally, uh, we wanted to see if a release of tension would be able to induce the accession. And so we did that uh, with a three new ways. First, we observed that uh, natural compression of the bridge was followed by ablation. So here we see, on, uh, you see cells created on natural patterns to have a, a nice shape and a nice position of the bridge. But at some point here, uh, uh, on the yellow path, one cell is going towards the other one, here in the blood, and is contracting the bridge. You can see that the bridge makes a tick instead of being straight. And this event was followed by accession very rapidly. And on the contrary, when there is no uh, movement, no kink in the, in the bridge, the accession is uh, much more delayed. So first, we, we are uh, observed and quantified also that the natural compression of the bridge is followed by accession. We also followed on two different surfaces, three to move cells. We quantified the motility of the daughter cells and follow the speed of separation. And we, we saw that at the beginning, right after mitosis, the daughter cells tend to move away from each other, as you can see here, the high uh, separation speed. But then uh, they don't separate further, and they even move toward each other just before abscission, as shown here by this negative separation speed. So naturally, Every cell, before abscission, they move toward each other, and this is releasing the, the tension in the bridge. The third point uh, was to decide how to release the tension in the bridge. So we used, again, the photoavation system, and we showed that uh, when we cut the bridge on one side here, release the tension in the bridge. This uh, was followed by the abscission on the other side uh, of the bridge. With a certain delay here, which is exactly the same delay as a natural cell when they cut on, on one side and then on the second, on the other side with a very short delay, the 10 to 15 minutes delay. Finally, uh, we also showed uh, that uh, this regulation is, uh, is uh, um, this regulation is through the S43 component 
uh, which is the main attention machinery. As you can see here, when we do the addition, we just induce the formation of the final structure of this uh, component and these two additions. So I don't, I, I don't really want to go into the detail of that, but we have done a, a, a whole work to, to show that this uh, regulation is uh, acting through uh, the S of three components. So finally, uh, we were going to propose a full model of the regulation uh, of the very last step of sense vision by the environment of the site. So here on the left, on the left, uh, when cells are highly confined, uh, they have a very low separation speed, and this means a low tension in the grid and allows a fast addition with a regular formation of the ad uh, structure for the addition. On the contrary, when the cells are not confined, they can separate very fast and uh, produce a high tension in the grid, which perturbs the formation and the, the formation of the S part three structure, and this uh, leads to a delayed abscission. So to finish, uh, I would like to speculate a bit on the function uh, that could have uh, this regulation I showed you. And to do so, uh, we, we, we thought about a cell in the context of a tissue, and we thought that probably uh, keeping the grid between the data cells would be really important to establish the new cell cell adhesion after the division. And this could be important for the maintenance of tissue integrity. So if can that, I will show you an example of a movie recorded by collaborators in Singapore where they use, uh, they grow a monolayer under suspension, so which is under tension, and they, uh, and they follow uh, the cells in this monolayer. And you can see when a cell is dividing that uh, you have the appearance of a hole between the top of cells, but the cells are still connected by the intercellular bridge. And then these holes are closed during the re-establishment of the contact between the daughter cells. But on the contrary, when for any reason the grid is broken between the two daughter cells, so you can see here at this point that the grid is broken, the two daughter cells cannot establish a new contact between them, and this leads to the formation of a very big hole in the tissue which never, uh, which will never be formed. So we think that uh, at the end, uh, regulating when the grid is set could be very important uh, for the tissue integrity. So finally, uh, to summarize this, I uh, showed you that the final step of cell division, so the abscission, is regulated in time by the environment of the data cells. And uh, concerning intensity, the, the forces uh, that uh, are exerted on the industrial bridge, they don't help uh, the adaptation, but on the contrary, a high tension delays adaptation, and a release of tension triggers the adaptation. We have shown also that this regulation is implies the S for three components, the main adaptation machinery, and we think that uh, maintaining the industrial bridge to be really important for tissue integrity, and we have other examples um, to say that it could be also important for um, tissue muscle damage. And I would like to finish by acknowledging many people. Uh, here you can see the, the, the picture of the team of Master K at the Earth Future Home, so you know Master K. And so we have many people, and I work mostly with Carlo for uh, quantitative analysis. I would like to thank also uh, collaborator Daniel Garish, uh, Ina Posé, and Anthony Ayman for sales, Marcel Ballon and Irene Wong for the traction of microscopy, and uh, Mathieu Pino for the um, uh, membrane tension measurements. I did not present it today, but uh, we did a lot of work uh, together. And also people from the emergency at the institutory and uh, from the, the, the unit. 
And uh, thank you very much for your attention, and I think later we can have uh, questions and answers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julie. Very elegant work. Um, before we uh, turn over to uh, uh, think about your questions, but I will uh, just do a short um, uh, ref uh, refresh on our product. So Julie is using our, our older Image Express uh, um, instrumentation, and one of the things that uh, Julie had to do was to collect multiple sites um, to collect enough statistics to um, uh, gather the right amount of cells. And we talked to people doing cell biology work like that and and um, uh, screeners uh, collecting enough cells to get the statistics they needed was a very uh, important um, uh, part of the workflow that was a bottleneck. And so uh, we've made some improvements to the image stress uh, line and uh, I'll talk about that a little bit on the left. That's highlighted on the left. What we've done new with Image Express. I'll have one slide on that. And we've also uh, uh, made some changes to our Med Express software. And I'll, I'll uh, show you a few slides on that. So, on the on the Image Express micro side of things, one of the big things we did was to increase the field of view to address this issue with um, collecting enough cells uh, to get to the need. So with a very low um, mag objective, like the 4x here, uh, what you see is uh, on the standard system, the green would be the field of view of a 4x objective within a 384 well. And you're capturing uh, somewhere around a, a little un over a quarter of the well, right? With the new XL system, the larger field of view and the scientific CMOS detector, you, that 4x objective would get a whole team for well, so about three, a little over three times the number of cells in one image. It, and of course, it scales to um, uh, 20 and 40x um, when you need high resolution data gathering. So it allows you to collect less images to get the number of cells you need. Additionally, the new XL uh, uh, model comes with a solid state light source, which gives you uh, sort of on demand illumination, eliminates uh, mechanical shutters and uh, reduce the support requirements because you no longer need to change the light bulb. Okay. Additionally, on the, uh, so this is sort of what it would look like uh, in terms of assays. This is a, uh, a 10x assay. On the left is uh, the number of cells you would acquire. This is a neuronal assay. Um, this is the number of uh, cells you would be acquiring, 120 in a, in a um, uh, cells in this field of view versus you probably get more than 500 cells uh, with the same uh, magnification um, with the standard objective. And, uh, this only can uh, improve your assay window or, um, or, or assay quality um, uh, and, or, or, and it also helps you drive down the number of sites you need to acquire to get the, collect the cells you need. So if you collect very large fractions of field you need 50 images to collect 75% of a well with the standard system and only 16 images. In this example, for a 96 well plate, a two color uh, assay, it would take us about four minutes to acquire this uh, with either system, but you collect three times the amount of data with the, the Excel. Uh, also, uh, our analysis software is based on Metamorph. Uh, and we have all the features of Metamorph software in, embedded in MetaExpress. Um, and this enables those hundreds of applications that we've, we've talked about. Um, one of the new features in Metamorph is the ability to generate custom, uh, custom application modules, not just the canned ones. Uh, and we want to be able to create any analysis either with these custom modules or with Word journals. So a little bit about the custom modules. Uh, why would you go to custom modules? You can do a lot of them. You can now analyze color or transmit light images. You can do morphometric classifiers, shape analysis. And one very important thing is objects inside objects. So here you're showing the counting of uh, dots inside new rights. Okay? Uh, so you can do objects inside objects. Uh, you can also use it to cut down the number of segmentation steps, support less data than you would with a CAN module, uh, maybe possibly driving analysis to be faster. Uh, custom modules are modules. They can be shared and they can be run uh, in our, in our uh, high throughput uh, image analysis um, uh, tool called MetaExpress PowerCore. 
So this is what the new uh, custom module interface looks like. It's an all-in-one interface. Um, you have your tool for finding objects at the top, finding objects uh, using application modules as objects, modifying objects, modifying images on the top. On the left, you have the steps that you would uh, create to create your module. And um, once created, you don't have to recreate them, and you just go and modify them like a module. You modify the parameters inside. At the bottom is a film strip to help you step steps you through what, what the module is doing. Okay. Um, the custom module editor is, uh, as I mentioned, all in one location, but they can be shared. So this this is an example of looking for memory and intensity um, that was generated in, a, in Metamorph, not in Meta Express. But once it was created in Metamorph, and memory intensity is these yellow the yellow ring around the outside. Uh, the blue is the nuclei, and the light blue is the whole set as well. Once you adapted, have generated this module, and it was generated in Metamorph, um, and this is a pretty complicated one with many steps, once it's created in another tool, the other tool like Metamorph, it can be brought back into Meta Express and use in Meta Express or use in Meta Express PowerCore or share with your colleagues. Here's a, uh, another one. It's actually not as many steps, but it gets you a lot of parameters out of, out of one module where there are, uh, you can uh, fix different things that you can be uh, classifying. Um, all the cytoplasm, which is one A, uh, a cytoplasm that has some intensity or shape and shape difference that's over some positive, uh, that you would call classify as positive. One C would be uh, light blue. Light blue uh, cells are those that are, um, uh, where the green is negative, it's below some threshold. Uh, you, can you can classify objects inside the cells, like um, whether there's some uh, mitotracker stain and how much mitotracker stain. And lastly, uh, you can uh, classify your nuclei, whether they're apoptotic or not apoptotic. And once you've got one of these modules now, you can take, you can, you can uh, use it and you can run it across uh, in, uh, a parallel processing uh, software called Metaplus PowerCore. Uh, uh, it's an option. It drives the analysis to be faster than image acquisition. Uh, each module can now be run across a, a computer core, um, and uh, that drives your speed of analysis down to be faster than acquisition. So this is the number of parallel processes uh, that you can run. And somewhere between 8 and, and 15 cores, uh, the analysis is now faster than acquisition. So there's many uh, example applications now to be accelerated. But I give you an example of memory analysis, finding functions inside uh, objects inside objects, uh, co-localization assays, wooling assays, many more formatry, more formatry assays can now be uh, uh, modules can be generated and they can be accelerated with MetaExpress PowerCore. So the new MetaExpress Micro now with MetaExpress Five. Uh, you can now run more screens because you can collect less. You have to collect less sites. Expand with your application, your application space with that uh, software. Uh, there's tools to perform hit selection faster. And we, just as all these pretty images you saw from Julie, we pride ourselves on maintaining high quality images um, uh, and doing a uh, long life to last day. So those those tools remain with the images with Micro XL. Uh, as a reminder, here's the the screen to remind you how to submit questions. I hope Jane has uh, gotten lots and lots of questions from you. Uh, please submit them and send this uh, by send. And Jane, um, maybe you can um, um, take over and um, some, ask some of these questions that have come through. All right. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yes. All right. Great. I do have a few questions from the attendees. Uh, first one I'll ask is, um, someone asked Julie, could the um, so-called natural compression be twisted microtubules? Um, so for sure, uh, it leads to bent microtubules. Switch speed, uh, I don't think so, it's really rare, but we often see bent microtubules. And it has been uh, proposed, not very really well known, but proposed that uh, bent microtubules uh, are uh, more vulnerable to be severed by uh, protein like fasting and so on. So indeed, 
the the bending of microtubules could help also to cut the microtubules. Okay. Um, uh, one question was a lot of your images were showing uh, bright field cells, uh, cells in, taken in bright field, but also you had a lot of fluorescent images. I guess your cells were expressing GSP or what live cell stains were you using? So it was a stable cell line expressing um, histone and cherry, histone 2B and cherry to record the, the DNA signal, and also alpha tubulin EGFT to record the fluorescence of the microtubules. And so uh, the way I, I just follow the addition is by looking at the fluorescence of the microtubules. And it's quite easy to see with that uh, when the bridge is cut because you see the, the microtubules in the bridge that are, that are simply cut. Right. But uh, just a little detail, I also uh, always follow the Bryce's image because it gives you a lot of uh, information about the cells, how healthy they are, uh, how they move, how uh, sometimes you can see also quite well the membrane, so it, it can uh, it can give a lot of information. So, so I always record the uh, and and uh, Bryce's image. So you see the image and all right. And then um, when you talked about uh, fraction force microscopy, uh, one of our listeners wanted to know if you could briefly explain how that works, that technique works. Yes. Sure, sure. <laughs> I, I, I think on purpose this time because I didn't want to spend too much time, but it's a very good question. Uh, so the principle is to place cells on a deformable substrate with a known rigidity. So we use uh, polyacrylamide gel. Uh, so these are hydrogel that are very soft, like 5 kilopascals. And uh, they are coated with fibromectin, so cells can adhere on the gels and deform the gel. And uh, then we just follow the deformation of the gel using uh, fluorescent microbeads. Uh, these beads are embedded in the gel, and basically when the cells are uh, pulling or pushing off, uh, on the gel, we just follow the displacement of the bead. And then with uh, saturation, we can, uh, if we know very well the rigidity of the gel, we can then saturate the forces that cells exert on the substrate uh, to deform it. So it's basically the principle of the traction force microscopy. And we use it uh, in combination with the photoablation of the bridge. Uh, to really have a clear measure of the forces that are exerted between the data cells and not uh, on the substrate. That's the, the way we access this force. Okay, I hope it was clear now. Okay. All right, then um, when you said you make these um, substrates, the, let's see, what is it called? Micro pattern substrate on a glass bottom dish. Yes, um, you can explain a little bit how you do that. And when you say glass bottom dish, is it actually a single well dish or are you doing it in um, micro plates? Um, so the, so the two questions the, the, about the glass uh, dishes. So I usually use, uh, use a single uh, dishes, 35 millimeter dishes with a glass bottom. After that, or sometimes uh, I use a six well plate with the glass bottom. And uh, as I treat uh, the, the, the glass, usually I just stick a cover stick on the bottom of uh, this uh, six well uh, plate without any bottom. And for the fabrication of uh, the micro pattern, so uh, it's a well documented technique now, so there are a lot of papers on it. And the principle that we use is to coat the glass with a recursive protein, a recursive molecule, which is a polylysing peg. Uh, then we burn this peg uh, through a, a photo mask, which contains the, the pattern. Uh, so we burn the peg with the, with the TV, one, uh, 150 uh, nanometers, something like that. And so this will burn the peg only where the patterns are, so we can decide on the mask, uh, we can design any shape, any size, and so on. And then uh, we just uh, incubate with the adhesive molecule, which for us is a fibromectin. 
And then fiber necking will stick only on the burnt uh, pattern. And at the end, we will have a surface uh, which has been glass, but which is coated with PML peg, which is repellent, and only on the motif, on the pattern, with fiber netting, and these patterns are added. So it's the technique we do in the lab. Right. You, it sounds like you have access to a lot of really great equipment. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, another question, which maybe Grisha or Julie, which either one would like to answer, was someone asked if you could speak a little more about the microscopes used, or the imager, I guess. So you wanted to explain what you have in the lab, and I'll expand on it, or what, what other options are possible. Okay, no problem. So in the lab, we have an uh, image access micro. Uh, which is equipped uh, with a, so I don't remember exactly the camera, but the regular camera which is done with uh, this uh, system. Uh, and importantly, we use uh, an objective which is a 20x with a high numerical aperture, uh, 0, um, 0.75. Uh, we have also the, um, uh, the environment control for the temperature and the CO2. And we have also the transmitted light model to follow the transmitted light uh, imaging. And yes. uh, then, well, that's it, basically. So I'll expand a little bit about, so that's the, that's the system they're using. So the Inhesis Micro is a uh, wide field high corner screening system. It accepts uh, plates and slides and uh, different, different formatted um, samples. Uh, you can get it from anywhere from 1x to 100x. Um, uh, with a variety of working distances and numerical apertures, people are screening. Uh, she's using the 20x.75 uh, NA. People go all the way up to 40x.95 NA. Uh, so for very high, high resolution, cytoskeleton assays. Um, uh, people do multi-day experiments with the light cell module because you can do CO2, humidity, uh, all three uh, temperatures, CO2, and humidity. Um, uh, we, you can ha have it outfitted with phase optics if you want the phase or phase of bright field imaging, and it also has a fluidics option. At the end of this webinar, there'll be a uh, little form if you want more information, more details than, than I've described. Uh, just let us know, and well, we'll get some information to you. Okay. That answers all the questions from the attendees. I think if we're ready, we can wrap it up then. Okay. Um, I will switch to the last slide. Uh, so thank you very much, Yuli, for a really elegant talk and very, very, very interesting work. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. You're welcome. If, uh, can everybody still hear me? Yes. Yeah. So if, uh, if uh, uh, you have questions about her work, I'm, I'm sure she'll be trying to publish, and her email is up there. Um, uh, if you have questions about our products, uh, please, uh, please feel free to contact me. Uh, we will have some additional webinars coming up soon. You can find the next one, which is actually tomorrow, on our main website under the upcoming events, just right on the homepage. Um, uh, tomorrow's uh, webinar is about emerging induced pluripotent stem cell applications in drug discovery. It's not an imaging, purely imaging-focused talk. It's uh, imaging and computers both. Uh, in December, in early December, we'll have a talk on uh, back to high content screening on preparing assays for genome-wide RNA ice cream using high content microscopy from um, uh, Stephen Brown at the University of Sheffield. Um, if you want to learn more about our products, uh, highsuperimaging.com is our, is, our, uh, is our website. And uh, with the introduction of our new tool, the custom module generator, we also have, um, are working with, our, uh, with the Metamorph group to have a forum where customers and end users and our own application scientists can share tips and tricks and uh, modules themselves that they're created uh, with, with each other. Okay. So hopefully we'll see you again. Please stay in touch. And um, if we didn't get to answer your questions, please email one of us. Thank you. <laughs>